Welcome to Life Recovery Today with Stephen Arterburn. In the next half hour, you'll obtain insights and tools to transform your life using the biblical principles found in the 12-step program. We believe everyone can benefit from a life recovery experience because we all have struggles in life. Struggles with addictions, food, depression, anxiety, and relationships to name a few. You'll be encouraged to see how others have found a new way of life with hope for the future through life recovery. Your host is Steve Arterburn, founder of New Life Ministries and Women of Faith, author of over 100 books, and teaching pastor at Northview Church in Carmel, Indiana, one of the 20 largest churches in America. Steve is the co-editor of the Life Recovery Bible, the number one selling recovery Bible. With over 3 million copies sold, this is the Bible given to inmates by Prison Fellowship and the Pew Bible for the Salvation Army. Now here's Steve. Hi there, Steve Arterburn here and welcome to Life Recovery Today. You know, 100, well, it's a pretty big number. I remember this is the uh, special edition of the 100,000th Life Recovery Bible. They used to send these to Dave Stoop and I, and it came out 30 years ago. We're celebrating that 30th anniversary. And it was in the Living Bible. The New Living Translation hadn't even developed yet. Well, today, We've got a new 100, not 100,000, but this is the 100th episode of Life Recovery Today. Who knew? (laughs) So today we're going to reflect back on some really great insight, I think, that were provided by some of our past guests. And uh, as you'll hear, um, the first guest, pretty special to me. But you know, we started this program with Um, interviews with folks about their story, and then we sensed that people wanted more than just stories. They wanted content. Uh, You can hear a story by going to a meeting, and we want you to do that. Last week, I was preaching at a church, Life Church, in Cookville, Tennessee. They had one church, 23 life recovery groups in one church. I mean, just an amazing recovery uh, environment, people wearing life recovery t-shirts, all of this. It was fantastic. So if you don't have a life recovery group in your church, you might think about starting one. And uh, that would be a great celebration of our 100th anniversary here. You know, even though I say it all the time and we try to communicate it, people still have that misconception that recovery is just for drug addicts or alcoholics. It's for those people. Well, I'm telling you, it's not just for those people. It's not true. Once you start exploring real recovery based on God's truth, you learn that it's, it's a discipleship program and it's a sanctification process. Well, my wife, Misty, she was in recovery uh, a long time, even before I was. And she's been in recovery, uh, well, let's just say, a long time, decades. And uh, right now, I want you to listen to her uh, as she shares that she learned that life recovery really is for everyone. But before she does, I just want to be sure that we make a couple of points about life recovery. It is based on Christ. It's for everyone because Christ is for everyone. It's based on biblical principles because, well, the Bible is for everyone. And you know, the original founder, Bill W. and Dr. Bob, they said they got them from the good book, especially the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, Sermon on the Mount, and the book of James. Well, if you got something based on the Bible that's for everybody, then recovery is for everybody also. There's nothing greater than to see somebody with a Life Recovery Bible. They explore it, maybe for the first time. And then they see, as they open it up, every principle there, like surrender, like turning your life over to God, to making things right with others. Everything applies to anybody that believes in God and God's truth. Well, here's my wife, Misty, and uh, she's going to talk to us about life recovery being for everyone. And she's been telling this story for a long, long time. Here's Misty. I was a newlywed at the time 
and my marriage was already imploding very early on but yeah. I remember turning on the radio show and I thought what is this all <laughs> I heard people you know divulging their most private darkest secrets and I heard a lot of compassion from you and the other counselors and yeah. and people started making progress and I was quite interested in that and I thought if that's what it's like to talk to a counselor maybe I could do that. Mm. And you did. I did. And then the counselor was the one that said, hey, maybe you ought to look at a recovery group. Yeah, right. Early on, she suggested to me a 12-step program. And at the time, I was married to someone with a sex addiction. Of course, I didn't know that's what it was at the time. Yeah. We didn't have that kind of language for it at that time. At least I didn't. Um, the church had called it a lot of things like perversion or lust and sin. Um, but we were really looking for help. And then my counselor suggested that I begin a 12-step. <laughs> <Hey, yeah. laughs> and so I did take a bit of offense at that early on because yeah. I, like many of us, was in a position to point the finger and blame. And I truly thought if he would get his act together, I would be okay. But wisely, the counselor knew better and she sent me into the rooms of recovery. And that's yeah. when everything began to change. The next thing that happened for me was that as that marriage dissolved, um, I began to no longer have anyone to point the finger at, and I began to really start taking very deep inventory on my own self, and I began to see my own addictive tendencies. And I started to go to groups about uh, relationship addictions and food challenges. Once the 12 steps came into my life, I began to see how they do apply to all areas. And so the challenges of recovery are always there, but it's challenging not to be in recovery. There's mm -hmm. pain in, in yeah. either direction. And so what I remember trying to do was just always trying to pick a very productive pain. Which one is going to lead me into some hope, into something better? And once I got started, the answers started coming so quickly um, that I had a lot of encouragement to keep going. Mm. You know, life recovery really does lead to freedom for anyone. And uh, these recovery desires are really all about freedom. And many people have setbacks in the recovery process. And, you know, they just don't recover. They give up. Well, I want you to hear from some of our past guests on what finally helped them achieve that lasting sobriety, that lasting recovery that never changes. Now I'm going to play five clips of five different guests and every one of them, they have an insight here on what helped them make their recovery finally stick. Now maybe you just wandered in onto this program and you're not in recovery. Well, listen to what these five folks have to say, because maybe there's something that they could tell you that would finally get you to say, it's time to give up trying harder and surrender and turn my life over to the highest power, God. So this final time, uh, you never uh, went back or, you know, it was the beginning of kind of the, the longer term recovery. What, what do you think made the difference this time versus uh, a couple of the other times that you were uh, getting better, but you still had a setback or two? Sure, it's authenticity. Hmm. How much do you really want it? And do you believe that God is who he says he is? Well, when it says um, that this is an honesty program, it, it really would be better maybe if it even refined it a bit to say it's an authenticity program. Hmm. What, what does authenticity mean to you when you use that word? Well, definitely being honest and, um, you know, just getting, I think it's just getting all of the junk and all of the hurt and all of the lies that we stuff down into our heart. You, you get it all out and you take it out of the darkness and you bring it into the light. And that's where God does the most transforming work is when you're able to just really bring all that ugliness into the light. Hmm. As the 12 step community, it's so important for our guys to find a sponsor and a mentor and to get involved and to be a part of that process because history tells us that that's what's proven to keep us 
a life of sobriety. Amen. And so we got we to gotta keep giving that back. We got to keep letting them know that a relationship with Christ and working these steps, you know, on a daily basis is what's going to keep you in a place of being sober. And that doesn't mean we don't have tough and hard days, but that gives right. us an opportunity to face those and we don't have to be alone. I have known loved ones who um, will leave a family event to go to a meeting because they I'm need sure. to. You know, that's just their routine mm -hmm. and they're in another uh, location, like they're mm -hmm. not home, they've traveled. Yeah. Um, you know, can you speak to the need to go to meetings in the middle of the traditional, this is just what we do oh, sure. as a family? Sure, I would say the most important thing about um, the holiday and your recovery is your recovery. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. um, traditions, um, it, you know, at New Day, we talk about no sacred cows. Like there is nothing that we can't change. And mm -hmm. so if you, your new tradition might be, you go to a meeting, right. you know, every, right. and maybe even bring your family. Um, I mean, which is okay to Don't do. Don't go meddling now. Right. I mean, <laughs> right, right. Or maybe your family goes to um, a, their own type of meeting yes. somewhere else. So, mm. um, but that anything can change. You know, oh, well, we make, you know, we make cookies at three o'clock, but I have a three o'clock meeting. Right. Okay. Well, could you make cookies at two? Right. Or four thirty? Right. Or you know, can you change? It doesn't have to be the same. And I think that's the. It, Sometimes it can make us sad. Yes. You know, you, yes. Might ha you may have to miss out on making the cookies at three yes. o'clock. Right. Um, but right. you know what? You can always create a new tradition. Right. And, and it's what's healthiest for you in recovery, right. um, not, not the tradition. Right. So. You know, one of the, I love that idea. I think the most important thing I did was listen and follow direction from people that had that glow in their eyes that I'd never seen before when I came into the rooms hmm. and people that maybe not had nice materialistic things, but they were wholeheartedly genuine, good people. Um, that is the best thing I ever did. And I gave it, I gave it a solid effort for one year and no matter what I wouldn't pick up, although I wanted to use many times for one year, I'm going to listen to those guys and I'm going to do whatever they tell me to do. And well, Josh, the, um, I'm so glad you said that because I've been saying to folks, you know, there are two different types of surrender. One is, you know, this big spiritual thing and you're all in. But the other is just a willingness to comply. You listen and do what the other folks say. You don't even know if it's going to work, but you know what you've done hasn't. And you're such a great example of that. So I, um, I went to a couple meetings a week in the beginning, maybe three or four. Um, I did not go every day, but um, I, I went meeting shopping and uh, I found a meeting that, that I had some connections with. Just some people were warm to me, made me, made me feel like I wasn't an oddball. Um, and I listened and um, I picked this old man. Um, his name was Happy um, and uh, he was much older than I was. But his answer for everything was God. And um, he was a big book thumper and clearly a big, big book thumper. And uh, I asked him to be my sponsor. And um, he, it, was, it was funny because there was another guy in the room that entered the, about the same time that I did. And I didn't know this, but that particular meeting had, had bets placed and the bet was not on me. And um, so James, his, his real name was James, but Happy turned and, and kind of said, as long as you do what I say, and I had, I had tried this a couple of times. I've been to a couple of rehabs. I've been in and out of meetings. And uh, for the first time in my life, I was willing to do what somebody else told me to do without Aaron trying to do it his way. Yeah. And I, so, I said, absolutely. So do you remember um, after you started recovery, that, did the craving ever uh, become pretty strong uh, after that at any one time? And what did you do if it did? It was a tough, um, I'm going to say six months. Um, wasn't every day, but um, I, would, I would find something else to do. I would, I, I would call James. Um, I, I very quickly started a little network of, of sober people. Um, but I think the big thing I did is that I kept myself physically busy. That's, yeah. that's what I did. Um, yeah. You know, I, I would get up at six, seven o'clock in the morning and I wouldn't stop until it was time to go to bed. Well, what I'm hearing is kind of the no fail approach or the most likely to succeed approach. Mm. You went to meetings, you got a sponsor, and then you developed these supportive people around you, not just a sponsor,
but go to folks and then you didn't lay around feeling sorry for yourself. You stayed busy. Now, if yeah. I could just get every person that I've ever worked with to just do that, I mean, the, the success rate would be so strong. Well, as you saw, our last two guests shared that a willingness to comply is what finally made the difference for them. But for some, step nine, making amends, is a hard step to comply with. It sure was for me, because I had people uh, to ask for forgiveness, a lot of people that I had hurt. I owed money, all sorts of things to make it right. But you know what? When I finally made it right with everybody else, you know, I had received Christ's forgiveness. But until I made it right, until that step nine was completed, I still had shame. But once it was completed, I was free. I could look anybody in the eye, or I didn't have to worry about somebody coming up to me and looking me in the eye and saying, there's some unfinished business. Well, I want you to hear from a past guest who helps us to see that you can make amends and there is a way to do it. Let's talk a little bit about motivation. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's, you could say, what's a pure motivation that you like to see somebody uh, exhibit? Yeah, there's really two or three things, Steve, that I think are critically important when we get ready to make the amends. The first thing is oftentimes when we make an amend, someone has wronged us also. And so I need to make sure, and my clients need to make sure when they go to make that amend, that they have forgiven that person. And that's a wholly different process because my motive is going to be suspect if I go to make amends or if one of my clients goes to make amends with somebody and the forgiveness question is still out in the open, then what's my real motive for making that amend? The next thing is, and I feel really strongly about this, uh, I think when I make amends with someone, I need to name the character defect. Yeah. Okay. So I need to walk into somebody oh, I and like say, that. I was stingy, mm -hmm. I was a know-it-all, I was greedy, I was mean. Mm. I was uncaring. I was selfish. I think it's important, and I think it kind of cements the rest of someone's 12-step program to be able to walk in and name that character defect and then to say, you deserved better than that. Mm. And I want to make sure, for whatever our relationship looks like going forward, that you get better than that from me. But if you had anything to say uh, to folks as we close out uh, on the ninth step, what would you say would be a really important thing to keep in mind? Don't do it alone. Talk to your sponsor, mm -hmm. talk with clergy, make sure your motive is clear. And then the other thing is, don't be afraid. You've lived the worst life. The amend is not gonna be the hardest part mm -hmm. of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, you've already been through a difficult, difficult time where you wouldn't have wound up at a 12-step program. So bite the bullet, talk to people, make that amend. You'll be more comfortable in your own skin. And when you walk down the street and you see that person, you're not gonna wanna turn and look the other way. Well, I love Scott, and uh, he's been a great encouragement to me, and uh, I love his encouragement to you to not be afraid in carrying out the steps and as a reminder that you have already lived out the worst of your life in addiction or whatever problem you have. So now it's time for a new way to be. Step 12 in recovery tells us to carry the message forward. Everyone you heard from today is doing that by sharing their story. You know, sometimes it takes a lot of courage to do that, and then it just becomes second nature. Well, one way to carry the message forward is by being involved with, or maybe even leading, a life recovery group. And I want you to hear from this guest about the power of a recovery group. And I, I'll tell you, I've been in maximum security prisons in these recovery groups, and they are powerful even in the worst situations. The thing about your life is you're really connected with other people and right. you're connected in groups and stuff and the healing power of a group. Talk about yeah. that just a bit about how that enriches a person's soul. Absolutely. Group is so essential. And I we took this group of women who, after I shared my story, other women came forward and identified and to be able to encourage one another and to say you are not alone yeah. so whatever it is that you think that you were the only one you are not and so we are here for you to be honest and we are here to 
pray with you and to lay hands on you and mm. to to remind you of the recovery principles, to remind you of the life that you said you wanted, like you wanted freedom. So I'm going to remind you of that. And then I'm going to point you back to Jesus. And then there's so much grace when, you know, you fail. But like, we're going to walk this out together. And community is so essential for that. Mm. So. Yeah, I mean, I think without it, you can read about God's grace. You can hear about it. But in community, in group, you feel yeah. the acceptance and love well, that a lot of people don't. Kylie shared about the grace that abounds in a life recovery group. And if you're ready to experience that, well, we can connect you with one of the hundreds of life recovery groups that meet around the country, online, overseas. You can find a meeting. I want to encourage you who have been around recovery, who've maybe been in a life recovery group, to take the next step and carry that message forward by starting a group, especially in your church. Well, to help with that, we have a staff member devoted to helping you with all things life recovery related. She has an amazing recovery story of her own, and we shared that on a past Life Recovery Today episode. You could find that on the New Life YouTube channel, where we archive all previous episodes. But right now, I want you to hear from Terry Ward, who is making a huge difference in this world, and she can make a difference in yours. She'll help you do whatever you need to do. Hi there, I'm Terry Ward, and I'm the Life Recovery Group's coordinator here at New Life Ministries. I get the privilege of helping people start life recovery groups in their communities. We have life recovery groups all across the country and even overseas. So my story, well, about 15 years ago, I went to a 12-step recovery fellowship, a secular 12-step recovery fellowship, and I was able to get clean and sober after over 20 years of addiction. About eight months into my sobriety, my brother shared the gospel with me, and I was able to identify Jesus as my higher power. I began to struggle with not being able to share my faith within the secular rooms. So I began to look for a way to incorporate the 12-step program, which I knew worked so well for me, with what I was reading and learning in the Bible. I soon found the Life Recovery Devotional, and it was the perfect tool to bridge that gap. I started a group and I led groups for many, many years. And now, like I said, I get the privilege of helping you start a group. So you may be asking, how easy is it to get started? Well, New Life Ministries has made it really simple by putting together a life recovery starter kit. This kit contains the life recovery Bible, the workbook, the journey, which is the basic textbook for the group, and it has that life recovery devotional that I spoke about earlier, as well as a leader's guide. The leader's guide's packed full of helpful information to help you get started. And it even has a meeting guide that walks you through how to transition from one portion of the meeting into the next. But remember, life recovery is completely customizable, flexible, and scalable to help you meet the needs of the group you want to minister to. So you may be asking, where can I start a group? I have seen it work really well with the support of the local church, where they have the covering, the, the resources, and the encouragement of their pastor and the, the pastoral team. But I've also seen it work well in other settings. We have a group in Hutchison, Kansas, that meets every night of the week in a coffee shop. They've even gone and planted groups in the surrounding communities. They are really doing something big out there. I even had a conversation recently with a young man who found a life recovery Bible while in prison. And it made such an impact on him that he started a life recovery Bible study right there on the inside. When he was released, he wanted to duplicate that sense of camaraderie, fellowship, and community. And so he went to, into the, his community and he found local businesses and agencies that would come alongside him, sponsor and, and provide resources for him to get a, a group started right there in the community center. That group has made the front page of their local newspaper. 
These are exciting stories of what God can do when we're just willing. So if it stirred something up in you and you want to have a deeper conversation about it, please call 1-800-NEW-LIFE, ask for me, and I am eager to help you get started. So remember, New Life Ministries provides help and hope in life's hardest places, and life recovery, well, it's for everyone. Well, I hope you've enjoyed, as my grandfather would say, our 100th episode of Life Recovery Today. You know, uh, we've come a long way since old Dave Stoop and I got the first 100,000th Bible sold. We're approaching 4 million now, thanks to Prison Fellowship, Salvation Army, and so many others. Maybe you could be part of spreading the word and doing that old 12 step by thinking about somebody that is struggling, not just with addiction, but depression or whatever. As many of you know, Bill W. talked a lot about depression. He went through uh, deep depressions also. And so life recovery is a totally new way of thinking. It's about taking responsibility to do something. You know, we want to ask God to do what only God can do. But we also want to do what we can do. Nehemiah is known for building that wall and uh, many people use him as a model of leadership. At one point he says, we prayed to God for protection. And then we stationed our people on the wall to make sure we were protected. I think that's an amazing balance. We're, we're asking God to do something, but we're not just expecting him to magically protect us from everything. We have to do our part. And so recovery, meetings, working the steps, reaching out to other people, all of that is part of a recovery program that gets better and better rather than weaker or weirder, as we've seen in many people. Now, if you need some help, we want you to call us 1-800-NEW-LIFE. If you need help with your group, ask for Terry Ward at 1-800-NEW-LIFE. It's also the place where you could order a Bible. The paperbacks are very inexpensive. And maybe you see somebody struggling and you just say, here, I want you to have this. I think you might like it. Recovery really is for everyone. We've been saying that from episode number one to this one, our 100th episode ever. I'm hoping that uh, we'll be around for a couple of hundred more, and I hope you'll be around with us. If you are, let us know when we get there. It won't be too long. In the meantime, you call us at 1-800-NEW-LIFE if there's anything we can help you with. See you next time. Thanks for joining us for Life Recovery Today with Stephen Arterburn. We hope this program has helped you integrate God's truth and wisdom into your recovery journey. This program is brought to you by New Life Ministries, and it's your support that keeps this program on the air. When you contact us for any reason, be sure to let us know that you watch on NRB. Call us at 1-800-NEW-LIFE or go to liferecoverytoday.net. Please join us again next week for more Life Recovery Today.